Hey folks, Rob Avis here. I'm here with Carmen and Christian, and this is their home as well as the headquarters for Urban Farm School. So we're gonna go through their entire property, and, and actually I'm kind of lying, we probably didn't even get to their whole property. It's such a big lot here in Calgary, and there's so much going on. So we'll probably have to do another profile after this one, but there's a ton of content in here on pollination, rainwater harvesting, greenhouses, hail protection, pretty much you name it. <laughs> um, and so make sure you watch the whole profile. I'm gonna leave all their information in the show notes below. They offer yard tours, which I highly recommend that you come to. Um, and Carmen's always running courses on one thing or another. And Christian is just incredible in his ability to, to produce a lot of these structures here, which really yeah. supports the permaculture Absolutely. approach. So let's go get a tour. Okay, all awesome. Right. All right. Let's do it. All right, go for it. Hi, I'm Christian Van Scheppen. I am the partner of Carmen Lamoureux, That's me. The, the owner, founder, and genius at <laughs> Urban Farm School here, here in, in Calgary, Calgary Alberta. Yes, Go ahead. and we're hanging out here in our Zone 3 permaculture garden, the backyard portion anyway, and it's a gorgeous day, and uh, yeah, we're happy to share our space with you and our property. So tell me a little bit about your property. We live on about approximately um, just under a quarter acre. We've got a really generous sized pie shaped lot uh, that for years was nothing but grass from stem to stern. We're in the southwest of Calgary, so we're fortunately positioned because we're quite near a large body of water, which is the Glenmore Reservoir. So that really helps to moderate our, our, our uh, climatic conditions here and gives us a lot of um, really nice microclimates also in this zone. So, um, yeah, so the property is pretty well food production from from front to back and uh, and we really strive to create a beautiful oasis for us to live in. So the Calgary climate is quite variable here. We have, um, you know, our seasonal, our seasonal highs and lows are pretty variable as well as our daytime and nighttime temperatures are hugely variable. So, uh, so that's very challenging. Our, our our growing season is actually, strangely, three weeks shorter than uh, 300 kilometers north of us in Edmonton. So uh, definitely our proximity to the mountains really affects our, our growing season here. Yeah, I think, I think Robert Heinlein said it best when he said, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Right. So I would call the, clim uh, the Calgary climate unexpected. Unexpected. <laughs> and so what are we hearing right now? That's thunder. We're hearing thunder, actually. We've had a bit of weather system move through, so... Yeah. Yeah. Another example. Yeah. You never know what Typical you're going to get. Day. You never know what you're going to get, and you never know when you're going to get it. That's correct. Uh, so yes, growing in a hail belt is very challenging. Um, we never know. Once the summer storms start coming in, thunderstorms, we can almost always expect some form of precipitation, and often that includes hail, and it can happen. Um, in a pea size shape or golf ball size like we had last year. Yeah. So some of the strategies we've got in place um, in the garden that you can see um, are, are strategies that we've developed over a long period of time through trial and error. And these are strategies that work really well for us. So it's very, very difficult to watch your entire garden be completely obliterated by one massive hailstorm. Yeah, we, we tend to live on um, on a couple of different weather websites, uh, literally watching radar. <laughs> you know, if they're talking about storms, we'll check the radar five or six times a day. Right. Right, just to see what's what might be coming. And you never know what you're going to get. Right, and oh yeah, we're, we're trying to be really resilient with our strategies. And um, I mean, we used to be the crazy people that every time there was a, a, a thunderstorm or a rainstorm, we'd rush out with all kinds of covers and and i guess you know we just grew tired of that that wasn't part of our lifestyle plan so we decided that we'd better do something yeah about it. and if we weren't home if we were on the island or something out in victoria we would always worry to death whether our crops were going to be there when we got home that's right right um so our roles um i have a uh, building background as well as a software background but but the the, the background i love most of was the building background and uh, so I act mainly as uh, support for Carmen. Um, my nickname is uh, PISS, which stands Mr. for the Mr. 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 Piss, which is the Permaculture Infrastructure Support Specialist. Uh, I came up with that myself. Um, and basically, I, build, I help Carmen build the structures around here. We design everything together, and we, we uh, agree on the plans that we come up with for, for building things like hail shelters or... Right. raised beds or you know garden sheds or whatever it is we want to put together 
Great. Yeah. Yeah, and so I basically do most of the planting and planning around that, um, crop rotation strategies, soil building, that sort of thing. Um, of course, Christian does help with that because he's, he's some very good manpower, hmm. very helpful. I have a truck. Um, he's a truck. I have a pickup truck. truck. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of what we do. And then we use our property as a teaching tool for my students from urban farm school. So it works out really great to have strategies here that we can, we can give people in ideas and inspiration on how to implement permaculture principles in their own backyards. Yeah, well, especially in a, in a northern, you know, northern permaculture yes. urban setting, yes. right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you hear a lot about per permaculture and its uses on uh, acreages and farms and that kind of thing, but um, it has a very, very widespread set of applications for the urban the urban landscape. Absolutely. Yeah. Some yeah, there. doing permaculture in the city, um, I mean, number one, that's where huge population base is. Um, we have a tendency to be really disconnected from our food supply in urban in urban environments, uh, which, which I think is something that we desperately need to change. So that's one reason that I'm really drawn to permaculture. Also, being sort of a hyper-practical kind of person, um, I, I just think that there's it just makes so much sense. Um, all the strategies that we're that we're using on our property, um, you know, have their source in natural ecosystem design. And and you know, having had a career um, working with natural resources, I I really see the, the the deep inherent value in that and the necessity to be super connected with with our food growing systems. And it doesn't matter whether you're growing on a balcony, excuse me, or growing you know, on a large acreage or large, large um, land management, you, you know, your responsibility um, as a human being on this earth, I believe, is to, is to understand where your food comes from and to have that connection with your food because yeah. that's part of the cycle of life. Right, and I think, I think we're, <clears throat> we're meeting a growing number of younger families who care a lot more about where their food comes from <clears throat> and they understand the fact that a lot of the food that you're, they're buying in the supermarket right. is a very low nutritional value. You can buy all the veggies you want, but if they come from Mexico and California, they may have a very, very low nutrient value, whereas the foods you, you grow yourself that you can pick right out of the garden will be much higher and denser in nutrients, right? right. And, much better tasting, too. Yeah, and we're, 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 we're well past the point where um, we can continue to place all of our... our, our um, What's the word I'm thinking of? That we can, that we can place the responsibility for our food supply so far outside of our realm of right. influence, yeah. and Grocery giving stores, up our yeah. our sovereignty over our food supply, to me, you know, to third party entities that have no interest in your right. health or well being, is you know kind of crazy. And right. It's not certainly not the way I was raised, and I see the value in those traditional. And I mean, growing growing food is a very important life skill. Let's it face is. it. If you if Absolutely. you know how to grow food, you can always feed yourself on a, a little bit of land, or at least get connected <clears throat> to the people who grow your food. That's yeah, really even key. yeah, you, sometimes as be. importantly, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yes, I I I did grow up in a, a family where um, we we were five kids. My mom was was the youngest of ten. She lost her mom when she was only three years old, and so she was raised largely by her brothers. And, um, and she had to be incredibly resilient uh, growing up that way. And all the brothers hunted. And so we always had a freezer full of wild game of all kinds. We always foraged for berries. We, Mom was just so resourceful. And, and that, um, that ethos has stayed with me all of my life. And then we did a lot of uh, traveling uh, when I was younger and went to countries where, you know, you really had to work hard to source your food. And, uh, and so it was, became just so apparent to me, not only our personal relationship with food, but our relationship with vendors, people who were selling the food and grow, growing the food and selling the food, how that um, was not something we could really take for granted. So, so this whole ethos around, you know, um, understanding where your food comes from, being, being mindful of what's required to put food on your table, whether you're sourcing it from a from someone who's growing your food or from the animal that was hunted to be placed in your freezer, this is something that um, that really made an impact on me as as especially as a young woman when I returned to Canada, I really felt strongly that my responsibility was to um, dive right in and start uh, you know creating 
opportunities for myself to grow my food and to and to learn and I had great neighbors who gave me opportunities to um, to be mentored by them and so yeah it was it was um, definitely my upbringing has informed my career choice today okay. so given our uh, our harsh climate um, short growing season and unexpected weather we've had to you know come up with a number of strategies to to deal with some of these issues so um, frost you know frost is early early season late season thing right it's not too hard to deal with right just cover up for the frost but well but also um, the season extension <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that's true. The season extension through the greenhouse. I, I was going to refer more to the hail structures yeah, because yeah. Um, we came up with an interesting innovation um, that uh, we were thinking of building a green, an, an extra greenhouse over our tomato, our main tomato growing area. And I engineered it and I had it all thought out and I looked at the money involved and I thought, you know, not everybody can afford a greenhouse. Um, so, you know, I showed the plans to Carmen and Carmen looked at it and said, why are we roofing this thing over at all? Why not, why, why not just put insect netting over it to stop the hail, let the rain and the wind and the sun through? And, and uh, as you can see, um, we've come up with a very interesting structure. It was very, inter it was very easy to build, very easy to plan, and it was, it was cheap like borscht. Uh, you know, it com compared to a $4,000 greenhouse, yeah, absolutely. Um, the big, this big unit with the blue netting on it ran around between seven or $800 and about 10 hours worth of work or less. And that's because you chose high-end wood to build it with. Yeah, and that's, that's only because I chose cedar because I try to build everything with cedar, but you don't have to. Right. Um, it wasn't a difficult thing to build. It didn't require any major tools um, nope. and it served our purposes quite well right. so far. And another strategy that we use on the property is, um, you know, understanding our particular microclimates within this yard. So we actually have this very oddly shaped and positioned yard with lots of deep corners in it. And so we actually don't get eight hours of sunlight on any yeah, part of nowhere. our property. And yet we get massive amounts of abundance um, because our soil is really great. We've nurtured that over a number of years, but also because we really, really understand the microclimates that exist in our yard. So we're actually maximizing the potential of all of these sweet spots in our, in our garden to grow um, the vegetables that require more heat and more light. So that's been a great strategy for us. Um, that really helps out also just the season extension that the greenhouse provides us. We, we can get easily another three weeks to a month on each end of the growing season. So. Um, in a, in a northern climate like ours, especially with our very uh, volatile weather, this I think a, a small greenhouse like this, or even a cool, you know good sized cold frames, could could pr produce the same end yeah. result, just giving you that little extra growing time. Absolutely. So just to give people an example of how harsh it is here, um, we can have a 20 degree Celsius swing between daytime and nighttime temperature here without any problems whatsoever. So those. Especially midsummer, we also have super long uh, days, daytime lengths. So plants are photosynthesizing like crazy during the day, and then super short night times. So for rest and respiration, and then um, in addition to that, the the temperature swings up and down, up and down. So all of that that massive temperature swing um, and day length swing really seems to stress out our plants. So there are some things we can do. We can't do anything about day length, but we can certainly help out with temperature swings. Uh, so we really only have uh, between 100 and 118 to 20 frost-free days here. So our last spring frost is on average around May 26th and first fall frost on average around September 18th. But in actual fact, it's been known we can have frost any month of the year here in Calgary. So it's, And snow too. And it's, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah. So managing that um, takes a, a sense of humor and a whole lot of persistence. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the other elements that we've um, implemented here uh, on our property, in, including the vegetable gardens and so on, we've got a few of those. Uh, we've got a front yard, uh, edible landscape slash food forest. Um, we've got some hugo culture beds out front. We've got, um, we've got our greenhouse. We've got our large scale water harvesting uh, set up here and we also have a number of other uh, systems that harvest water for us. 
Um, probably the most important element on our property is 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 our soil building uh, that we do on the property. So we're really constantly. Um, geeking out over soil health. Well, don't forget the compost bins. And too. the compost bins and yeah. the back alley. Huge compost yeah. bins. Yeah, so we really, we're really keen about composting thermophilically so that we can be building up um, our microbial populations, which is super key to, so pr especially to producing in a short season. Like this is really, oh, yeah. without good soil yeah. health, your plants are just not going to thrive and they're not going to produce uh, food for you to last you through the winter. So what else have we got going on here? We've got some food forestry behind us as well. Well, we've we've um, got a couple. We've got several uh, espalier apple trees and plum right. and pear trees. We've Small got um, uh, a kiwi trellis, a hardy kiwi trellis. Mm -hmm. um, several hail structures. Some great, great um, trellises. Yeah. We've got. We uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, um, we also have uh, a number of uh, structures that we use for. You know, storing wood and other bits and pieces uh, for storing tools, um, mm -hmm. and we're we're capturing rainwater off of all of those surfaces as well. Right. Right. So for two reasons: one, we don't want them to go in near foundations or erode soil, uh, and two, of course, we want to use the water right. for uh, for various purposes. Right. And we've also thrown in just a ton of teaching tools here on our property for the students that come through, and we do a lot of tours of our permaculture properties. So. It's great to be able to give people ideas for their small space growing as well. Right. So we've got a, a, a potato tower, which is awesome. And we've got a couple um, small space uh, buckets for growing raspberries. If you don't, if, if you love raspberries and you live on a balcony, if you have a balcony, you can use them. We experiment um, with we a experiment lot of different lot. things yeah. to show, you know, yeah. so we can see whether they work or Absolutely. not. And, and we can teach them in, in your... Uh, yeah. In your courses, yeah. And then, in addition to that, we've got a number of um, just really quiet spaces on the property. So we've got some sanctuary zones, little places, hidey holes, people to sit, um, grab some privacy, just sit and contemplate. Uh, I love those on my property, and they're a great use actually for spots that maybe you can't find an alternate use for. So um, like that, and also we've got a few fountains here. We love to attract the birds. Uh, we've got great insect populations here, lots, of, lots yeah. of diversity of insect species, and the birds are, are a part of uh, managing that part of the ecosystem too. So I started Urban Farm School shortly after I took the PDC with Rob, and that was in response actually to what I saw as a need. In fact, you know, so many of us in that particular PDC were concerned about what niche we would fill within the permaculture community or the community at large. And so it was towards the end of the day, Michelle was explaining to some of the students how to use um, the um, soil blocker, which is a way to start seeds without containers. And by the response of the students in my class, and I think we were a student, uh, student group of about 30 people, I realized that probably 90% of those students had never started a seed. And I was kind of gobsmacked by that because I thought, wow, like I was the oldest person in my class and I thought how amazing and awesome and dynamic and motivated all of these young people were in my class and they wanted to go out and change the world and they totally had the ability to do that. But the simple act of putting a seed in the ground was something that up until that moment wasn't in their repertoire. I thought, wow, you know, with all of my experience in you know, for forestry, sustainable land management, and soil health and all that jazz, plus my years of growing food, I felt that I could really offer that value to give not only graduating young PDC students who didn't have those skills, but also the, the, the public at large about how to, how to get those resiliency skills um, under their belts. And so I started with just a few workshops um, and the demand was obviously there. So it was really challenging for me because I, I was very nervous talking in front of a lot of people. Um, and I really had to push myself through that fear-based paradigm, that fear-based idea I had about who I was. But I thought, no girl, if you're going to do this, you're just going to have to push through this fear and do it because you're afraid of it and not in spite of the fact that you're afraid of it. So, so I just kept year by year pushing through that and expanding my repertoire, bringing in instructors that had the skill set and the awesomeness that I didn't possess. And, uh, and we were able to really provide a, 
a huge opportunity and so, so like a wide range of of, uh, of courses for people to take to really build more resiliency and connection to their food supply. So it's been an awesome journey, and and um, and I love I love doing what I do now. I really feel this is what I was meant to do, and and it's very satisfying and uh, a wonderful way to, for me to support. Um, people of all ages to to uh, to grow some awesome <laughs> at the helm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, uh, he's been my right hand man here. I've uh, I I think I think with me it's it's a study in comparisons. Um, no gardening background whatsoever. Um, didn't like vegetables growing up. <laughs> Um, there aren't too many I don't like now. I think maybe carrots I'm still struggling with, and that's about it. I love everything else. Um, I have a building background. I have a computer software background, uh, a couple other backgrounds. And the, the journey for me, uh, you know, uh, hasn't been be necessarily because of Carmen, but, but Carmen and, and this entire paradigm has been a result of a process I started many years ago, which is self-introspection, self-understanding, and the, the, the realization that I create my universe. Um, so to, to be in a place like this, to do what I'm doing, um, is easily the highest form of, um, uh, of life that I've created for myself ever at any given time. So um, I've, I've become a permaculturist by osmosis. I have not been taken, I've not taken a, a permaculture design certificate course, even though I've been offered one free uh, <laughs> numerous times by the best of the best. Um, and I will someday, I promise. Um, but, you know, I, I, I still have a viable software business that I work with. Um, and I get to work on this you know, part-time, I get to partake of the benefits. I get to live in arguably one of the most beautiful sets of surroundings uh, I could ever have imagined. And I get to work with the most beautiful woman I've ever known, who is, who is remarkably intelligent, uh, spiritual, and, and um, you know, every day inspires me to, to, to love and to create something even better than the day before. That's that's amazing, but you know, it's the only to way to put credit, it. You have been to absolutely every single workshop I have ever held, save for one, because you were out of town. You have been like the best support system I could ever have imagined. If I if I dream it up, you say let's do it. I'm the ultimate roadie. He's just been amazing. So, it's been a wonderful journey together. Yes, so it has. Far, and long may it continue. It'll go forever. <laughs> So hopefully you guys have found this video super interesting. Um, I've spent most of the afternoon with these two amazing people and uh, they really are practicing what they preach. They're practicing what they believe. Um, they're not just hiding it in their backyard. They've actually exposed <laughs> themselves. We've exposed ourselves. <laughs> we put it all out front. <laughs> 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 and uh, they're really, you know, showing uh, the world how they can be just as positive as, as humans are thought to be negative. And uh, I really love this example. I mean, there's insects everywhere. There's, there's smells, beautiful smells coming out of the garden. Um, and there is a sign there that we should capture. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Very Pollinator important. habitat. Absolutely. I, I forgot about that. The I'm only sorry. thing wrong with this is that I'm the only one with wine. <laughs> well, we're going to fix that shortly. <laughs> So Carmen runs Urban Farm School and Christian is an incredible support to Urban Farm School and basically is, is uh, just as they, they both are basically showing and educating Calgary how they can be as positive as they are negative by changing their landscapes and producing nutrient dense food. I'm going to make sure that uh, there's a link to Urban Farm School in the show notes below. Carmen is also one of our primary teachers for the permaculture design course. Um, and so you get to learn from, from her when you take that program and all the incredible knowledge that she has to share here. So make sure you check out their website, check out their YouTube channel, and what other social media channels Instagram? are you guys on? Instagram? Yeah, we have an He's Instagram my Instagram account. dude. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll put, we're working on more. Okay. <laughs> well, the world probably doesn't need any more social media. But <laughs> anyways, not. give me a thumbs up and leave a comment below if you have any questions for Carmen and Christian. And we'll see you guys in the next